think he's been a hero of public health and his uh, leadership uh, in confronting uh, HIV AIDS in a way that I think few people, if any, that I know other than Peter could have handled it. So it's really a pleasure, Peter, and an honor for us to work. welcome you back and to hear what you have to say. As long as HIV is not under control everywhere, it's not under control anywhere. Well, it's the first time that we're seeing some progress that's measurable, less people dying, less people becoming infected. Um, but AIDS is not over. Um, and it's far too early to, to cry victory. First of all, when you look at uh, uh, Southern Africa, uh, we can safely say that these are countries that are hyper-endemic for, for HIV. And in some parts of the continent, in, uh, around Central Africa, we see a major increase in, in new infections. We see also new epidemics emerge. What we're seeing today in Asia, in about every single major city, is what we've been seeing in the West in gay populations in the early 80s. Just as we saw about uh, um, 10 years ago, 8 years ago, and um, major epidemics among injecting drug users in Eastern Europe. And we probably will see more surprises, although this doesn't come totally as a surprise, but we'll see new uh, populations that are being taken. It was the first major uh, viral illness where um, treatment became available on a large scale. But at the same time, it also confronted us with the problems and the challenges of chronic care. Chronic care, um, which has changed the face of, of AIDS, but also um, which later on would be introduced for the first time in, in, developing, in many developing countries. The, Approach has been rights-based, and what did I mean by that? I, do, I mean by that that it's particularly after a while it was driven by activism and not inhibited by um, lectures that we got in terms of saying, okay, budgets are limited, so it's not possible. Then we say, okay, in that case, the budgets have to increase. If the price of drugs are too high, we have to decrease the price, and so on. Um, and that is quite a different approach than usually in international development. You say, okay, this is your budget. And now you've got to, you know, it's coast containment, and, uh, and you've got to make sure that you can uh, make the best out of that. Uh, we said we don't accept that. The needs are there, people are dying, and we need them. AIDS is an example, and it's the more, maybe one of the most extreme examples, but not the only ones, where we can say that good politics saves lives, bad politics kills people. And this is not just uh, how to say political, um, this populism. Now, it really uh, <coughs> means that if the wrong political line is being followed, that people are dying. Um, a recent study by a group at Harvard University estimated that President Mbeki's denialism about AIDS and refusal to introduce antiretroviral therapy as soon as it was available and, and, uh, and that South Africa had the means to do it, uh, that, have, that cost the lives of about, you know, over 300,000 people. So th these policy decisions, they do make a difference. It's not just a, um, a theoretical thing. Activism by particularly people living with HIV has been a driving force in the response to AIDS, even in getting more money for research. Despite their reputation, the, the, the Dutch are absolutely not thrifty. They're, they're the most generous. Um, Dollar, if you take it by, um, by GDP of the country. In other words, how much is that country given by the wealth that it has? And uh, uh, the Netherlands comes out of number one when it comes to it, so followed by Sweden, Ireland, UK, and then the US is uh, like in the fifth position. Money alone is not enough. And there's also the other part of the equation, and that is that um, the uh, the cost of, uh, of commodity, the cost of doing business, the lower it is, the more we can do with the same amounts of money. Um, this is where I think UNAIDS uh, really made an enormous difference. Uh, today, the cheapest um, first-line regimen that the Global Fund is, is uh, paying for in the developing world is $85 per person per year. What we did is that uh, UNAIDS was the, um, started the first treatment programs in Africa, before Médecins Sans Frontières and all that, um, in uh, Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, and in, um, in Kampala, in Uganda, 
just to demonstrate that it was possible to provide this kind of complex treatment. We had this list, you know, this kind of list of 123 reasons why this is not possible. Therefore, we went for it. And uh, also because we... And most of these um, obstacles are still there. And yet, if you really want to do it, you can move mountains. That's, that's what we demonstrated collectively. The AIDS epidemic is still in a very dynamic um, stage. We are not there yet in terms of the spread of HIV. And this is from uh, Cambodia, where you see who became infected year per year. And, uh, you know, uh, male clients of sex workers, sex workers, etc. The type of people become infected have changed. And for example, in much of East and Central Africa today, most people uh, who become infected live, are uh, partners in stable relationships. Harm reduction for injecting drug users is something that um, is not reaching even 10% of people in the world who need it. And that's an eminently political issue. Um, and the countries where injecting drug use is the most prominent mode of transmission, like the whole of the former Soviet Union in most countries, providing clean needles is illegal, even methadone is against the law. So how can you stop an epidemic if you don't have the, re the necessary policy changes? I think AIDS has created enormous opportunities for global health. So increased funding, collateral benefits, as I said, a culture of accountability, tiered pricing of medicines, so it was an absolute breakthrough, it didn't exist before, uh, engagement of non-medical sectors, a global <coughs> research on health, and a major interest by young people. I'm, I'm so impressed how many students and young people really want to learn and do global health. Um, and, uh, and that's for me perhaps the most encouraging sign of all. What I feel strongly about myself is that when we make policy, we have to walk on two legs. One leg has to be science, and the other one has to be justice, equity, and so on. And we don't need evidence for saying we need, you know, equality between men and women. We need, you know, we need equity in access and so on. That is a value, and that's justice. Secondly, another basis is nothing for the people without the people. The time is gone that we could uh, sit in a room in Geneva and WHO and say this is what has to happen, and then we'll shovel that to, to the throat of the countries, because it doesn't work. It's as simple as that. Thirdly, I think, as I mentioned before, multidisciplinarity is going to be the hallmark of tackling problems in the 21st century. The problem is that education is not based on that. Nobody was trained like that. I wasn't. And uh, we need to develop a new culture of that, of multidisciplinarity, and even how to talk to each other. Information for accountability and programming is something that we're still in the infancy, but. Uh, also, uh, here I think you know, you're know you playing a big role as, uh, um, in Seattle. And thinking long term. Um, we are now at the stage in the AIDS epidemic where we've indeed made progress, but now we've got questions of sustainability. Four million people on antiretroviral therapy. Great. First of all, we have six million who need it and not on treatment. But these four million, 20, 30, 40 years from now, we still want people to be on treatment unless in the meantime a cure has been found. Um, that's quite a challenge. We have sustainability of uh, um, prevention efforts. All over Western Europe we see a rise in new infections among gay men. Um, and we see in a country like Uganda an increase in new infections. Um, so also the prevention is also for life and across generations. 